service this morning, and I'm going to go ahead and open us up with a, with a word of prayer. Father God, we just thank you for um, just every incredible thing that you do, God. We look at the, the, the changing season, and, and that, even as we think about it, which just blows our mind that, that that's a thing that happens, that you change the color um, of the leaves, and um, God, you, you prepare us for, for snow and um, it's just incredible the things that you've created um, and the way that you've designed things. And um, God, your creation um, just speaks to how incredible you are um, and how powerful you are. And God, this morning we, we sing praises to you because you're powerful and you're incredible and you're worthy of our praise. God, we love you so much. Um, we praise you um, in the wonderful name of Jesus. Um, God, we love you. Amen. Oh. oh, there it is. That's a bad note. I don't know what happened. We're going to see. Good thing we weren't in the middle of it. All right, here we go. <laughs> I'm 
21 through 24 says, But now, apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been made known, to which the law and the prophets testify. The righteousness is given through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. There's no difference between Jew and Gentile, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And all are justified freely by His grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. Thank you. 
Rod Lauks, I'm an elder here at the church. Uh, I've been here my whole life, so that's me. Um, so community devotion, um, I'm not Clayton, if you look at the uh, little flyer there, I'm not Clayton, I'm just doing his spot today. He called me yesterday and uh, he couldn't do it, well he texted me because that's what they do, they text, they don't call me, so anyway, so um, I thought... I thought it'd be a good opportunity just to share a little bit about my last five weeks. I didn't uh, warn any of my kids that I was going to do this. But. So, August 12th, 
I went into the hospital and my appendix burst. And so it's a long story up to that point, but we'll skip that part. So anyway, um, I went to the hospital. You know, after several tests, they determined that my appendix was about to burst. Well, I was very fortunate because they called a team of an OR team and a surgeon. They were there in 45 minutes, and I was in surgery in an hour. Well, in between that, my appendix burst. So it filled me careful of you, everything. So <clears throat> they uh, did the operation, and it's the it's a 12 year surgeon. He said he's never seen anything like it. So I mean, it was bad. So I spent six days in the hospital. And those six days, they you know, I told the Sunday school class. My doctor kept coming in, and he's like, "You are sick." He kept telling me that. Like, I already know I'm sick, but he would come in. I think he wanted me to know really how sick I was. And, uh, I mean, it was, they would come in and go, have you ever had liver problems? I'm like, no. Have you ever had kidney problems? I'm like, no, because the infection just had everything shut down. Uh, bowels were shut down. I mean, you could push on my back and it was water. You could just push in because, I mean, it was it was bad, guys. But... I remember my wife in the ER. We were in the ER room, and, you know, they were prepping me for surgery or whatever. She asked me if I was scared. And I told her, I said, no. And I think that's a a testament to, even though I was going through, you know, I didn't know what tomorrow was going to bring. I really didn't. I didn't know through all this. You know, you know, you know, God's faithful in everything. You know, it took, I'm still, it's five weeks, and I'm still really recovering. You know, there's a lot of things I still can't do. And I was the guy that did everything. And I can't even mow my own grass. So, I mean, I'm getting there, but um, I think really the thing out of all of this is that, uh, you know, we have to trust in His promises, don't we? And have faith. And he gave me the calm. Even though I had worries, I had concerns, my wife knows all of them. Even through all that, though, I knew that he was going to take care of me. My, my poor girls, I felt, I felt horrible for them because they would come in and see me and they were concerned or they were crying or whatever it is. And that I felt bad about that. More more than than I did being in there sick because it just killed me to see them the way they were. But but He is faithful. Our God that we love, our God that we trust, He's faithful. And it it reminded me, and, and you know, it's Proverbs. If I had my glasses on, hang on a second. No, there's some things, some things you just can't fix. So, Proverbs 3, verse 5. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Do not depend Do not depend on your own understanding. Seek His will in all you do, and He will show you which path to take. But then as I was reading this, I thought, I'm going to read a little bit more because I thought it was interesting. Don't be impressed with your own wisdom. Instead, fear the Lord and turn away from evil. Then... You will have healing for your body and strength for your bones. So, trust, faith. I, you know, we're all we're all in different phases in this room. We really are. But I'm here to tell you that through all of it, through my whole life, and through every situation, I've always been all in. And I think that. You know, with all of us, at some point in our lives, that's all we have, is we have God. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, we just thank you so much for this day, truly for the many blessings you give us, Lord, and just for this opportunity that we can just be here. Lord, we just ask that you just be with us. 
as we go in community time, Father, that we can just uh, remember what you did for us, that Today, uh, Donnie and Casey took a little break and uh, took the weekend off, so we're happy for them to get a break, and so we have a guest speaker with us this morning. But uh, next month, the month of October, is Pastor Appreciation Month, and uh, we would like to do a card shower for Donnie and Dustin and just uh, to show them the appreciation what we as a congregation have for them and the work that they are doing. So we'll keep that, we'll put that in the bulletin, but just to keep that in your mind. Uh, so we'll be doing that through the month of October. But this morning we have Randy Wheeler with us that's going to be bringing us the message. Randy is from the Solomon Foundation uh, group that we've been working with. And as we look at the direction of the church, Randy, I, I know he's a retired pastor from Michigan, I believe, um, so he can fill us in on that. But uh, here is Randy to bring us the message this morning. It's great to be with you all this morning. Uh, it hasn't been that long. I think it was earlier this year I was with you, but I had forgotten what a great worship band you guys have. Man, I'm blown away by that. And just love the spirit in this congregation. I always uh, love coming here. Uh, it has been great the past couple of years to be able to meet with various ones of your leaders and talk about the future of uh, St. Joe Church of Christ. And so I'm excited uh, about what God is doing here, and it's always good to be here with you. Uh, I've known Donnie for a couple of years, and I, I love Donnie. Uh, he has a passion for Jesus. He has a passion for this church and this community. Uh, one thing I love about him, and you, you already know this, he has a passion for the Word of God. Uh, he believes it cover to cover preaches it cover to cover, even the tough parts, and, and does not compromise. I have great respect for that these days. So it's it's good to be here with you. Uh, as the gentleman said, uh, I'm from the Solomon Foundation, and several of you are already investors with us. And uh, if you're not, but you're interested, there's some brochures on the counter at the back. But we take those investments, we invest them in churches like yours all around the country to help them lead more people to Christ. So that's who I am. Uh, I was a pastor in the Detroit, Michigan area for 29 years until uh, God called me to come work with Solomon a few years ago. And so I miss preaching. There's not a whole lot. I, I love to be in a pastor, but, but there's not a whole lot that I miss uh, other than <laughs> other than I miss most of the people from my former church, and, and I miss preaching. So I love the opportunity to get to open God's Word with you. So if you have your Bibles with you or you have your Bible app on your phone, open to Luke chapter 10. And I want to talk about living a life of compassion today. Uh, when Jesus wanted to communicate deep truths to people, a lot of times he just told a, a story. So this morning I want to look at a story of compassion. And show of hands, how many of you believe that maybe we have a shortage of compassion these days? I thank you. I, I have believed that, but somehow during COVID, it seemed like going through those two years, and I know it's still continuing, but uh, it seems like it has left us 
less compassionate than ever. Uh, more divided, more irritable. I don't know about you, but I am more irritable than I was uh, two years ago. And, and I think it's left us to a great deal more self-centered and less compassionate about what's going on in other people's lives. I heard this week about a man and his wife who walked into a dinner, dentist office one morning, and the man said to the dentist, Doc, I'm in a terrible hurry. I need a tooth pulled, but I've got a tea time for 10 o'clock. I've got two of my golf buddies out in the car. It's already 9.30. I don't have time to wait for the anesthetic to take effect, so let's just forget that. Let's just pull the tooth. And the doc said, are you sure? I mean, that's going to be pretty painful. He said, I'm sure. Let's just get it over with. And so the doc said, well, which tooth is it? And he turned to his wife and said, honey, open your mouth. Show him which tooth. It is. That's, that's a lack of compassion right there. And so uh, I feel like we need to, as Christians, live out our lives, live in this world as compassionate people. And I think a lot of times, even when we feel compassion these days, we don't do anything with it. We see a need, our heart hurts for a second, and we just walk along. And so I want to make this very practical today. I want to look at a story Jesus told that I think has great meaning for our lives. And I don't want you to just leave here thinking, oh, that, that's a good story Jesus told, or leave here thinking, yeah, that'd be more compassion. I want us to leave here ready to do something. Luke chapter 10, verse 25, a lawyer came to Jesus one day and asked him, uh, Teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Very good question. And Jesus, I don't know if you noticed this in the Gospels, he loves to answer people's questions with a question. And so Jesus asked him, well, what does the law of Moses say? And this lawyer must have heard Jesus preach before because he knew the right answer. He said, you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength and all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus said, that's a really good answer. If you do those two things, you're going to be in great shape. But have you ever noticed that lawyers love to take something that's simple and make it very complicated? So the lawyer had a follow-up question. He said, well, who exactly is my neighbor? And have you ever noticed that Jesus loves to take complicated things and make them very simple? And so he told a story, as he often did, beginning in Luke chapter 10, verse 30. Jesus said, a Jewish man was traveling on a trip from Jerusalem to Jericho. He was attacked by bandits. They stripped him of his clothes. They beat him up. They left him half dead beside the road. Well, by chance, a priest came along. But when he saw the man lying there, he crossed to the other side of the road and passed him by. Well, then a temple assistant walked over and looked at him lying there. But he also passed by on the other side. Well, then a despised Samaritan came along. And when he saw the man, he felt compassion for him. And going over to him, the Samaritan soothed his wounds with olive oil and wine and bandaged them. Then he put the man on his own donkey, took him to an inn where he took care of him. The next day, he handed the innkeeper two silver coins, telling him, Take care of this man. If his bill runs higher than this, I'll pay you the next time I'm here. And then Jesus added, Now which of these three would you say was a neighbor to the man who was attacked by the bandits? And the man replied, Well, the one who showed him mercy. Jesus said, yes, that's right. Now, I want you to go and do the same. In this very simple story, Jesus tells us how to live a life that pleases God, how to live a life of compassion, how to live a life that's going to make a difference in this world. And Jesus makes it very simple. First of all, he tells us in this story that it, it starts with opening your eyes and being willing to really see the needs around you. Not just notice those needs, but to really see them. The priest and the temple assistant, I think they noticed the wounded man in the story, but I don't think they really saw him. They didn't see him as a creation of God, as somebody worth stopping to help. 
And folks, I'm afraid that, that we do that sometimes. I know I do. How many of you have gone out to a restaurant and the waitress comes by your table probably five or six times during the meal, but you never really see her? You might glance at her. You might talk at her to give her your order, but you don't ever really see her as a, as a person, as a creation of God with needs and, and feelings. Right, we do the same thing with grocery store clerks. We go through, check all our groceries, never engage. I'm afraid that in a lot of our homes, we do that with our family. We live with them every day. But how often do we pause and ask ourselves, what's going on in their life? What needs do they have? Miss Thompson was guilty of that. Chuck Swindoll tells her story. She was a fifth grade teacher, and she had in her class a young boy named Teddy Stollard. He says Teddy was not the kind of kid who got invited to parties. He slouched in his chair. He looked bored most of the time. He only spoke when called upon. He never dressed right. He had smelly clothes. He's a rather unattractive boy. Whenever his teacher would mark Teddy's paper, she got a certain perverse pleasure out of marking all the wrong answers. And she would put the F at the top of the paper with a little flare. Now, she might have known better if she just read his school record. The history was there. First grade, the teacher wrote, Teddy's a good boy. He shows promise. But he has a poor home situation. Second grade teacher wrote, Teddy is quiet and withdrawn. His mother is terminally ill. Third grade teacher wrote, Teddy's falling behind. His mother died this year. His father is uninvolved. Fourth grade teacher, Teddy is hopelessly backward. His father has moved away. Teddy's living with an aunt. He is deeply troubled. Well, that Christmas came, and all the children brought presents for their teacher, Miss Thompson. They were carefully wrapped, except for Teddy's. It was packaged in brown paper, held together loosely with tape, and it was marked for Miss Thompson from Teddy. The teacher would open the gifts one by one for the class to admire, and when she opened Teddy's, it was a rhinestone bracelet with most of the stones missing and a perfume bottle that was mostly empty. And the other children started to laugh. But Miss Thompson caught herself, and snapping on the bracelet, she said, Isn't it lovely, class? And doesn't the perfume smell good? Well, at the end of the class, Teddy approached her shyly and said, I'm glad you like my gifts, Miss Thompson. All day long, you smelled like my mother. And her bracelet looked pretty on you, too. Well, after he left, Miss Thompson put her head down on her desk, and she just wept. And she asked God to forgive her, and she prayed that God would help her see what he sees when she looks at another motherless boy. But when the children came back to school the next day, Miss Thompson was a brand new teacher. She tutored the children who needed extra help, Teddy most of all. By the end of the year, he had caught up with most of his classmates, was ahead of some. But after that, she didn't hear from him for quite a while. Then one day, she received a note. Dear Miss Thompson, I wanted you to be the first to know that I'm graduating from high school. I am second in my class. Love, Teddy Stollard. Four years later came another note. Dear Miss Thompson, I wanted you to be the first to know that I'm graduating first in my class. The university has not been easy, but I like it. Love, Teddy Stollard. Four years later, another note. Dear Miss Thompson, I wanted you to be the first to know that as of today, I am Theodore J. Stollard in the how about that? I want you to come to the ceremony and sit where my mother would have sat. Because 
You're the nearest thing to family that I've had. Love, Terry. Now, the day that Miss Thompson began to make a difference was the day that God opened her eyes and allowed her to see this little boy through his eyes. And that's what happened in verse 33 of our story today, where the Samaritan, he saw the wounded man. And folks, if you want to live a life that matters, you need to go through life with your eyes open. And you need to be willing to, to really see the people and see the needs around you. And then secondly, you need to open your heart. And you need to be willing to let God break it. Jesus said that when the Samaritan saw the wounded man, it says he felt compassion for him. The message version says his heart went out to him. The Greek word there that Jesus used literally means to have a churning in your gut. Have you ever felt that churning in your gut when you saw a need? Have you ever seen someone in need and it, it just grabbed your heart and it wouldn't let go? I felt that about 12 years ago. I was reading an article in Christianity Today magazine, an article written by Rick Warren's wife, Kay. And the article is titled, The Street of Little Flowers. And I thought, what, what in a Christian magazine is there an article about flowers for? Well, I read in the article and found out the street of little flowers had nothing to do with horticulture. But it was talking about a dusty little street in a village just outside of Phnom Penh, Cambodia where little girls as young as five years old would be dressed up in mini skirts and high heels and makeup on, and they would be put behind iron bars for Western men to sit outside the bars drinking beer and looking to see which girl they would want to rent for the evening. And when I read that story, I, I had heard about child sex trafficking before, but somehow I just never never caught my attention. But that day when I read that story, man, it just crushed my heart. For the next few weeks, I just was uh, beside myself, just uh, in a deep funk that I couldn't get out of. And, and so I began to research. I found out that there's over a million children in the world that are held in, in sex trafficking. And the more I researched, the more I read, the more I had one of the clearest callings of God that I have ever had on my life. And I just knew God was telling me, hey, Randy, I want you to do something. I wasn't sure what to do, but I knew what I wanted to do. I wanted to get Rambo and Walker, Texas Ranger, and Jack Bauer, maybe Liam Neeson. I wanted to sit Navy SEALs. I wanted to get a group together, and I wanted to go over to Cambodia, and I wanted to rescue all those girls, and I wanted to take care of those traffickers. And I found out you can't do that. Uh, that's when I found out about Rafa House. It's a ministry. I don't know if you've heard of it, a ministry out of Joplin, Missouri, that has safe houses throughout Southeast Asia, where they bring rescued girls for restoration and healing and, and train them, equip them for life. And so, uh, my wife and I just flew to Cambodia and toured Rafa House and fell in love with their ministry. We were impressed by the quality of it. So I came back to my church and I said to the elders, Oh, we've got to we've got to sponsor this. We've got to put this on our mission support. We put it at the top of our mission support. Uh, and then I started taking teams every February from our church so awareness trips, and we would see the ministry and they learn about child sex trafficking and, and what they could do about it. Uh, first time we came back, they asked my wife to come on staff at Rafa House as the director of the prevention arm to try to prevent other girls from being brought into this same thing. My wife started a child sponsorship program to help protect kids. And when we left the ministry 10 years later, there were 850 children outside of Phnom Penh, another city in Cambodia, another city, uh, well, actually it wasn't a city, uh, a group of kids that were refugees from Myanmar on the Thailand border that were living at a garbage dump where they would go out each evening when the trucks came by 
and try to find uh, food and try to find things that they could sell salvage so they have a little money to live on. So there are 850 children that have a social worker. Uh, they're paying for their education, their clothes, and they would give their families rice every month so that the parents wouldn't sell the children to have enough rice for the other children. And when I first read that article in, in Christianity Today, my eyes were open. And I could see those children in my mind, but when we started going over there, I saw these children face to face. I got to know their names. And for the next nine years, every time we went over, we would meet children that were newly rescued. And our hearts would be newly broken over and over again. But that's okay. Because when your heart is broken by the things that break the heart of God, you need to pay attention to that because that's God telling you there's something I want you to do. And folks, here's the thing I've learned. A, a broken heart is wasted if we don't act on it. The Samaritan in this story, he saw the beaten man. He felt compassion for him. But notice in this story, it didn't stop there. It says, going over to him, the Samaritan soothed his wounds with olive oil and wine and bandaged them. Then he took the man, put him on his own donkey, took him to an inn where he took care of him. Folks, if you go through life with your eyes open and your heart open, your heart is going to break over the things that break the heart of God. But if you don't act on it, there's no relief. I heard someone say once that compassion without action leads to depression. One of the most heartbreaking photographs I've ever seen was published in the New York Times almost 30 years ago. A, a BBC documentary tells the story. It was 1993. And Kevin Carter was shooting photos of the famine in the Sudan when a soft whimpering sound caught his attention. It was a pitiful, animal-like sound. He moved towards it until he found the source. It was a young African girl crawling weakly toward the center of a clearing. She didn't have the energy to stand and emaciated. She stood very little chance of survival. Kevin thought if the plight of this little girl couldn't stir the world into action, nothing would. And he knew this instinct, instinctively and immediately, so he, he crouched with his camera, ready to frame an eye-level shot. As he did so, a vulture landed behind her, obviously waiting the moment of death. So he spent the next 20 minutes carefully framing the photograph being careful not to disturb the bird. And then he clicked. And he waited for the bird to fly off, and when it didn't, he chased it away. And then, Carter sat down under a tree and smoked a cigarette. And he says he talked to God. But even though there was a food camp only 200 meters away, Sticking to the journalistic principle of being an observer and not getting involved, he did not help the girl. Well, after the photograph was published in the New York Times, it became world famous, and it, and it did help raise awareness of global poverty. A year later, in 1994, he was awarded the Pulitzer Prize for that picture. But when word got out through the media that he never helped the girl, the media around the world criticized him. The, the St. Petersburg Times said, the man adjusting his lens to take just the right frame of her suffering might just as well have been another predator, another vulture on the scene. Well, two months after receiving his Pulitzer Prize, Carter drove his red pickup truck to a small river near Johannesburg where he used to play as a child and he attached a green garden hose to the exhaust. And at the age of 33, he took his own life. 
Now, we don't know all the factors that led Kevin Carter to take his life, but I, I do know the reality that compassion without action leads to depression. And friends, when God breaks your heart over some injustice in the world, you can sit around and be depressed about it. Or you can ask God, what do you want me to do about it? Now, to do something about it, you need to do a third thing. You need to open your schedule, and you need to be willing to have it interrupted. That's what the Samaritan in, in the story did. I'm, I'm sure this guy had things to do that day. He had places to go. He had people to see. Maybe he had TV shows he had DVR'd that he needed to get home and binge watch. There were probably things on his schedule that day. But he put his planner away when he saw someone in need. And he didn't just stop and slap a Band-Aid on the man and say a quick prayer and call it good. He spent the rest of the day with that man. He spent that night taking care of him. He allowed his schedule to be interrupted in order to take the time to love God by loving this man in need. And so let me ask you this morning, how willing are you to do that? Let's say you go to work tomorrow. And you see some coworker here, and you say, "How was your e- weekend?" And, and they say, "Okay." But you can tell by the look on their face and the tone of their voice, something's not okay. So what are you going to do? You have a choice to make. You got things to do. Are you going to just go on about your day, or are you going to pause and take some time and? talk to them and listen to them for a while? Are you flexible enough with your time to carve out a a few minutes to meet somebody's need in Jesus' name? Is your schedule open enough for God to allow some divine appointments? Because, friends, you're not going to live a life that matters. You're not going to live a life that has an impact. You're not going to live a life that puts a smile on the face of God if your eye is always on the clock, if you don't have time for other people. So open your eyes, see the needs around you, open your heart, be willing to have it broken, open your schedule, be willing to have it interrupted. And then here's, here's what's hard for a lot of people. You need to open your hands and be willing to rearrange your financial priorities. Did you notice in this story, the Samaritan essentially wrote the the innkeeper a blank check. It says he handed the innkeeper two silver coins telling him, take care of this man, but if the bill runs higher than this, I'll pay you the next time I'm here. This man could have raided the hotel refrigerator thing that jacked up those charges. You don't know what. He didn't care. He knew there was a man in need and, and finances are not an object. I think sometimes as Christians, we give our 10% and we somehow get this mistaken idea the other 90% is ours to spend as we want. And then there are those moments when God taps us on the shoulder and says, hey, get your checkbook back out. Get your, get your credit card out. Open that wallet because uh, that need over there, I want you to, to do something about that. And God tells us, uh, remember, if, if you really are mine, that means everything that, that you have is mine. We need to be willing to use it. That, that 90% God gave us to manage, He gave it to manage to, for Him. Were you aware that while there are over a billion people in the world that live on less than a dollar a day, uh, we spend over $600 billion a year eating out in America. We spend over $50 billion a year in America on our pets. We spend over $20 billion on video games every year. While there's a billion people in the world living on less than a dollar a day, don't get me wrong. There's nothing wrong with Christians eating out or having pets or, or having video games. But are you aware that in Detroit, where I live, there's a a ministry called Forgotten Harvest, and you can feed 
an inner city child for the whole summer for $10? That's two Starbucks coffees. I think that's kind of a no brainer. For $15, you can purchase a mosquito net through World Vision that's going to save a child in Africa from malaria. It goes on and on for through CORE Ministry. I'm not sure if you're familiar with them, but they work in, in Haiti. For $3, you can feed a child for a month. We just have to be willing to let God control that 90% that He's left in our hands to manage. So when He moves your heart, you need to be willing to open your hands. And it all comes back to this bottom line definition of the Christian life that Jesus gave us. It's very simple. Just love God so much that that love spills over to the people we encounter every day. And when it comes to our spending priorities, I think it's a matter of what we love the most. Do we love God the most? Do we love people the most? Or do we love the things that money can buy us in life? Several years ago, U.S. News and World Report wrote about a little seven or eight year old girl, a very thin little girl, who pulled her 180 pound father out of the swimming pool and saved his life. And a reporter asked her how in the world she was able to do that. And she said, Oh, it was, it was easy. I love my daddy. Friends, when your motivation is love, you can accomplish amazing things. Scott Harrison was a 20 year old, 28 year old nightclub and party planner in New York when, when God broke his heart over the millions of people who live every day without clean water to drink. And so he started uh, Charity Water in 2006. And so far, last I heard, he has funded over 600 water projects in 11 different nations. He's got brought clean water to over 2 million people because when God opened his eyes and broke his heart, he acted on it. Zach Hunter was only 12 years old when his life began to matter in a huge way. He had been studying in school one day about slavery in America back in the 1800s, and and it angered him. And he went home and told his mom, man, if I had been alive back then, I would have done something about that. I would have fought against it. Then his mother informed him there's over 27 million people held in slavery around the world today, more than at any other time in in history. And his heart was broken, and he knew that even as a 12-year-old boy, he needed to do something about it. So he simply went to his youth group and went to his school, and he asked the other students, his friends, to, to donate their loose change in the little coffee can that he carried around with him. And he called it loose Change to loosen chains. And they raised $8,500 that they gave to ministries who helped free slaves around the world. Well, it kind of caught on to where hundreds of youth groups and schools around the, the country were getting in on it. And eventually, Zach, uh, Zach wrote three books and, and was speaking around the country. And this started in the heart of a 12 year old boy. Now, folks, I'm not saying this morning that God wants you to write books or speak all around the country or raise millions of dollars to start a great charity. All I'm saying is that that you need to love God so much that you can't help but love other people that you run into in your life. And Jesus says that means you open your eyes, you open your hearts, you open your schedule, you open your hands, and you just meet needs in Jesus' name. And it can be very simple little things. Jesus said, I was hungry. He gave me something to eat. I was thirsty. He gave me something to drink. Small things. As a stranger, you invited me in. I needed clothes. You clothed me. I was sick, and you looked after me. I was in prison, and you came to visit me. And he said, anytime we do this for anybody else, we're, we're doing it out of love for him. 
It's just simple acts of love, things that everybody in this room could do. Mother Teresa was once asked how she accomplished such great things in her life, and she said, none of us can do anything great on our own, but we can all do a small thing with great love. So I'm encouraging you, start today. Jesus laid out the example of the Good Samaritan, and then he said to this lawyer, I want you to go, and I want you to do the same. So this morning, I'm, I'm asking you to, to leave the church this morning and, and do the same. Uh, you were given Band-Aids on the way in. Uh, if you didn't get one, there's some on the table on your way out. I would like to ask you right now to open that Band-Aid, put it on the back of your hand. Left hand, right hand, whatever works out best for you. And I want you to wear this Band-Aid as a reminder of the story that we looked at this morning and this command of Jesus to go and do the same. So I want you to wear this Band-Aid, and every time you look at it, I want it to remind you to open your eyes and open your heart and open your schedule and open your hands and, and to just go from here looking for people who are lonely or hurting or in need and have compassion for them. And meet needs in practical ways. And so I'm challenging you to leave that band-aid on your hand until you've done something. And I don't know what that something will be for you. Maybe you're going to go right out of here and say, i got to get this band-aid off my hand. I'm going to go to a nursing home and I'm going to visit somebody who's lonely and just needs somebody to listen to them. Maybe you're a student and... Tomorrow morning at school, you're going to have your eyes open and your heart open, and you're going to look for somebody who needs something. Maybe you go to the lunchroom and you see that kid that always sits by himself or herself at, at lunch, and, and you're going to leave your group of friends and you're going to go over and sit down with them and, and make a new friend. Uh, maybe it's uh, sponsoring a child. Maybe it's volunteering in a soup kitchen or a food pantry. Uh, maybe you'll go to work tomorrow with your eyes open for someone who is hurting. It's just small things done with great love that can change the world one person at a time. Let's pray. Father, uh, I love your word. And Jesus, I, I love your teaching. It's just so practical. So simple. You don't make it complex, a uh, hundred different rules to put a smile on the face of God. It's, it's just too really simple that we love you with a growing love that is so intense that it can't help but spill out to the people around us. And so, Father, we, we just simply ask this morning that you open our eyes and you let us leave here aware of the people around us that the waitress at the restaurant, the clerk at the grocery store, uh, the people that we deal with on online at the help department that frustrate us. And we just want to yell at it, but we remember it's a, it's a person that you've created who has needs, has a life of their own. Lord, wherever we go, this day, this week, this month, this lifetime that you've given us, wherever we go, Lord, Open our eyes and help us to see people as you do. Lord, open our hearts and break them at the things that, that break your heart. Lord, open our counters, open our hands, help us to be willing to take the abundant blessings that you put in our life and use them to bless other people. Lord, I pray that you would make each person in this room this morning to, to be a bright light in this community, this county, this area of Indiana. Lord, I, I pray you take the uh, uh, assembled people here this morning and, and, Father, shine your light, your love from this church in just a blinding way that this whole area will know this is, this is a place where God lives. 
These are people who love God and, as a result, love people far from God. Lord, I pray that, that this church would be known as a church that loves people and that meets people's needs. And, Father, I, I pray that for each person this morning, that as they go from this place, that you would just use us to be your ambassador to this world, ambassadors of love, that you'd use our lives to make an impact. And, Lord, we pray this in the name of the one who, whose heart was broken with our sin and in our distance from you, came to earth, died on a cross. He did something very practical so that we could be your children. And it's in his name that we pray. Amen. Thank you, Randy. Um, so one thing that, that, that stuck out, Randy talked about, um, a broken heart is wasted um, if it isn't acted on. We're about to, to close with the song of Thanksgiving. Um, and, and, and I'm thankful because we, we serve a compassionate God. Um, but I think compa- or compassion and thanksgiving work in the same way. Um, thankfulness is wasted if it doesn't um, change us in, in the way we operate in this world. Um, and so, why don't you stand up? We're going to sing, I Thank God. Um, and, and, and during this song, I want, you, I, I want you to just be thinking about and talking to God about how, how can I, I'm thankful for, for what you've done in my life. How can I help? do something in the lives of the people around me. Um, so just be thinking about that as a thing.